on an overcast evening at this aircraft factory in North Wales. A few survivors of World War II will gather to reflect on their contribution to that war. Early in the 1940s, a group of workers here set out to break a world record. They would try to build a bomber as fast as they could, faster than the Americans who in their factory in California had taken 48 hours from start to finish. It started on the Saturday morning. You just got cracking. You were all like busy bees, all busy hoping to do the best. Did you think you could do it right from the very start? Well, it, it seemed impossible. I remember all the bustle. Oh gosh, it was like a beehive, you know. Did you know that the Americans had set a world record for building a bomber? Oh, it was fine. They would always want to beat the Americans, don't we? The plane they chose to build was a Wellington bomber. The Wellington was, for many years, the RAF's main strike bomber. Apart from the Spitfire and the Hurricane, more Wellingtons were built during World War II than any other British aircraft. Aircrew love a plane that they feel that if they do their bit, the plane will do its bit. And with the Wellington, fantastically strong, very robust, totally reliable, crews always knew that even if you've been shot up on a mission, if you lost one engine, if you had all sorts of disasters of one kind or another, there was a very good chance that the plane would get you home. It was a lovely aeroplane to fly. It was just built so that you could shoot great hunks of it out if ever you had the misfortune to be hit. But it did more or less than shrug its shoulders and press on regardless. The designer of the Wellington was Dr. Barnes Wallace, who had also designed the bouncing bomb that would breach the Myrna Dam and make legends of the dam busters, the air crews who delivered them. Max Hastings has written a definitive work on Bomber Command. Barnes Wallace said he was almost prouder of having created the Wellington than he was of having created the bouncing bomb. It was a brilliantly inspired piece of construction. You can't design and build an aircraft in five minutes. It takes years to do. But in the mid-1930s, Barnes Wallace produced this inspired design. This extraordinary geodetic construction gave it the strength that enabled it to withstand a terrific amount of punishment. And of course the hydraulic turrets, that the RAF was enormously proud of those, that these were revolutionary technology in 1939, better than anything the Germans or the Americans had. And by the time that war came out, the Wellington was in full production. This sophisticated aircraft was designed less than 30 years after the Wright brothers had made the world's first powered flight. Britain got an enormous amount wrong in the 1930s about its own defences. And when the war came, it didn't have anything like enough of anything. Fighters, bombers, soldiers, rifles, machine gun, anything. But some terrific design decisions and production decisions were made. It was undoubtedly one of the great aeroplanes of the war. But Britain had also taken a number of acute political decisions in the 1930s. The Chamberlain government, while negotiating to avoid a war with Hitler's Germany, had also drawn up plans to put Britain's industry on a war footing. Manufacturing skills were pooled and the potential to build weapons of war were assessed. Shadow factories were built where tanks, guns, planes could be assembled. Broughton was one of them. Hilda Dodd was one of the first women to work at the Broughton factory. I went for an interview and they asked me what I could do. I said I could use a machine. And I said, what sort? I said, a sewing machine. My mother had a treadle. Oh, so they put me down for machine work. Can you remember your first sight of the factory? Oh, it was a mess, muddy, wasn't much there, and there was like a hangar, and that's where I went to, into this hangar. There was men working on parts of it, putting it together like a Meccano. At its peak during World War II, the Broughton production line was turning out 28 Wellington bombers a week. 
these workers were in the front line as much as the men who would fly the aircraft they would build. Easy aircraft to build. They had good long range and they're very economical, but they were produced quickly. That was the main thing. Instead of one, you'd get a hundred. The target these workers set themselves that weekend so many years ago was to build a Wellington bomber in 30 hours. Did you think you could beat that record? We had no idea we could. And so this evening, Bob Wilson joins old friends in the audience for a unique film show. This is a bomber factory in Britain. They started to build Wellington LN514 early one Saturday morning all those years ago. And because they wanted to tell the world how efficient were the British production lines, the British made a propaganda film about the record-breaking attempt. We had our cameras in position when the workers arrived at the factory. They put a North American voice on the soundtrack to show America not only that Britons could take it, as they had during the long years of the Blitz, but that they could dish it out as well. Many of the men and women who built this Wellington are seeing this film for the first time. The clock strikes nine and the record-breaking attempt begins. Two sections of the fuselage are carried in. The dark girl with the riveter there is Eileen Daphne, who used to work in a rayon factory. One of her brothers was killed in a naval action a little while back. Women filled the places on the production lines left vacant by the men who had gone to war. Betty Weaver was working on the counter in the local cooperative store when she was conscripted to go to Broughton. Living in a mining area, the men were either in the army or they were working down the pit. Is that why they needed women to yes, do the job? Yes, yes. What did you feel about that? Did you mind? Not at all. It was something completely different. I felt as if I was doing something useful for the change. My father was in the army, my husband was in the army and I felt as if I was supporting them in a way. Can you remember your first impressions of the factory when you first saw it? I was horrified. <laughs> I was issued with a big white boiler suit. It fit where it touched. <laughs> the fuselage parts are assembled in big frames they call jigs. You can get some idea now of the size of the bomber. It's almost 65 feet long. Women were, of course, absolutely vital. First of all, the war effort as a whole, and secondly, in aircraft production. And a lot of them proved very good at what they did. Britain mobilized women arguably more effectively than um, any other wartime nation, except possibly the Russians. Main assembly in Broughton Aircraft, it was a, a huge space without any columns. Were you good at electrics? I didn't know one end from a screwdriver to the other <laughs> when I got there. No. I am now. <laughs> what was the training like? For the first three weeks I never slept and all of a sudden it all slotted into place. And did you have to pass a test at the end of that? Oh yes, everything was inspected and if it wasn't right you had to go back and do it again. Here is Evelyn Coates, an inspectress who used to work in a draper's shop. She told me at this point that she had found no faults at all. Boys as young as 14 worked on the production line. Bill Anderson, who worked at Broughton until he was 64, first came here when he was 14. War seemed nothing to fear, simply a new experience. My father was on ARP one, and when they started dropping incendiaries, we used to go for the bucket of sand to extinguish the incendiaries. I think we were charging 6p for a bucket of sand. They were quite grateful for it, really. We used to go potato picking. You'd get let off in school. Then every weekend you'd go collecting rose hips. The use for rose hip syrups. That was for babies. All helping the war effort. It was all helping the war, but it was a game to us. These volunteer workers are giving the bonus they're earning today to the Red Cross Aid to Russia Fund. And they're out to break that 30-hour record they've set themselves. I started here straight from school. And there was a lot of women here. And they mothered you, if you like. What was the job that you were first shown how to do? The main wing spar was in two pieces. We had to join them together. They didn't use bolts, they had a type of long pins. In fact, the basic tool those days was a copper and hide. That's a copper hammer with a hide end. And they were used to knock these pins in. And then they were inspected. 
Across the factory and the wing assembly, there is more activity under the eagle eyes of the inspectors. Though you may not think they're working fast, the progress they are making speaks for itself. For it's only 10 o'clock, one hour from the starting time. Grace Wally and Hilda Dodd are doing a man's job of work, assembling the bomber's cabin heater. Hilda Dodd's peacetime job was in the local photographic shop. I was taught how to make the fuselage and bomb floors. Was the factory ever bombed? We had two lights up in the ceiling. One was amber and one red. And then one night the red light came up and everything went dark. We were told to all link hands and go outside and there was some air raid shelters. And as we were going down, I happened to look to the left and I could see some planes on fire. They dropped some incendiaries. Well, I was frightened. I don't think the majority of us were scared, but we were all right down in the shelters. There was just like wooden seats and you could all sit around and talk and sing. What sort of stuff did you sing? Oh, the old stuff. Gracie feels. <laughs> Back in the main assembly, the wooden floor is fitted to the fuselage. Notice how everything fits with precision. There's no bullying the parts together. One fits willingly with the other. The forward bulkhead frame goes in, and then the pilot's seat, control column, and the cockpit floor all in one unit. And how's the time going? Well, they've been working one hour and 17 minutes. You're working long hours. Oh yes, 12 hours. Eight to eight. It was dark when we went out of the morning and dark when you got home at night. When I didn't go on the works bus, sometimes I used to have a lift with a chappie from Greasby and um, we used to call at a farm on the way back and he used to get a couple of dozen eggs because we only had one a week then and he used to break three and swallow them whole but they must have been black market eggs, wasn't they? There was rationing at that time, of course. Um, did you... Uh... Rationing, but the, <laughs> all I can remember of the canteen were the chips and the rice pudding. It was all right until we went in the canteen early one night and all the chips were all ready to be finished, you know. Yeah. And there was a cat sleeping on the top of them, so we, we took a dislike to the chips after that. Testing the flaps on the wings is Eva Williams, a nurse by profession, testing fractures in tubes instead of in bones. The short, dark girl assembling the ailerons is 23-year-old Evelyn Homewood, whose husband is in the Royal Air Force. In a way, it was a job, but we were working for the boys. You were patriotic. Well, I was, for one, anyway. Well, they were fighting for a cause, weren't they? And that makes a difference. Everybody had somebody in the war, didn't they? They had somebody in the forces. So it was worth fighting for, wasn't it, to see them home again? Unfortunately, a lot didn't come home. Hilda Dodd's husband, Percy, was in the Royal Navy on minesweepers. Tell me about how you met him. Through a friend that worked in the factory, we went to a dance, and she introduced us, and she said, he can't dance, so I said, I'll ignore him. So I ignored him all night, but we made up after. Did you dance with him eventually? Well, uh, well, you couldn't call it dancing. You <laughs> it's like taking a wheelbarrow around a room. And then I found out after he was going for dancing lessons. He got called up to go in the Navy. It was all done in a rush. And he said, I haven't time to go and buy the ring with you. So I went and picked the ring myself. And then I never saw him again for three and a half years. My dad was in the 4th Battalion Royal Welsh Fusiliers and when Harry was called up, that was the 6th Battalion Royal Welsh Fusiliers. Tell me about the uh, wedding and your honeymoon then. Well, he came home on the Saturday, we went to see the vicar on the Sunday, we were married on the Wednesday and he went back on the Sunday and I didn't see him again for two years. Percy Dodd blew up the mines that threatened the convoys he was protecting. He was up and down the Mediterranean to Malta. I used to say me prayers every night and very often during the day when I was working, hoping he was all right. Yes, I was very lucky he came back. I mean, a lot didn't. 
There's our chief cameraman, Chick Fowl. It is 80 minutes since the attempt began. The airborne division went out to North Africa. The Clyde pilot regiment landed on Sicily and they came back to this country with some of the parachute regiment. But the part my husband was in, they went into Italy and then they liberated Greece. So that's why I didn't see Ali for two years. You wore a badge. Oh, my little naval badge. He bought me that before he went. No matter where I went, I pinned it on. I, that was part of him. He gave me that, so I always had that with me. Even at work? Oh, yes. I never went without that. At 10.27, the foreman gives the word, and into the framework of the aircraft pile the electrical workers, armed with the tricks and the tools of their intricate trade. It wasn't hard work. It was fiddling, connecting wires and things up. You had to be very careful. Construction went on, and the inspectors beamed with satisfaction. Bob Wilson was superintendent of the production line that weekend. He recalled elaborate preparations for the record-breaking attempt, a certain amount of pre-assembly. The electric wiring and all that was done on the panel before the fuselage was built. So you just had to drop it in? Right. Sharp practice was that? Exactly. <laughs> Sounds good, that, doesn't it? <laughs> How did you organize the production line? It did after the people knew what to do. At 1.45 in the afternoon, the main fuselage is ready to come out of the jig. Let's flip over to the stitching and doping section. The four great sections which give the bomber its 80-foot wingspan are now being covered with fabric. Flashing fingers and winking needles. One wrong move, the needle would hit metal and the point would break. Constance and Ben Mottram were courting during the war and married in 1947. Constance sewed linen for the rudders of Wellingtons in what had been a small car factory nearby. She worked the night shift. My auntie always had breakfast ready when I got in from work on the next morning. Yeah. And then afterwards, after I'd had breakfast, I'd brush my teeth, wash, freshen, and then I'd spend the rest of the day in bed till it was time to go to work. It must have been a very long night for them, all the girls, mustn't it? You know, Twelve hours night sewing all night long. There were a number of mines around the Broughton factory producing coal to fuel the British war effort. Coal miners were exempt from military service and Ben Mottram worked at the Fly Main Colliery. It started winding coal in 1921. My father worked there and he was there at the sinking of the pit itself. It was the deepest in Europe. In Europe, that's deep. It was as deep as Snowden is in height. When you're putting an aeroplane together, Connie, how did you identify the different screws and that sort of thing? When the plane was put together, it would be in the flight shed across another field. And where I worked, it was just uh, components. They were put on a shelf for us to part number. Yes. to engrave, and we put the number onto the parts that was going to go onto the aircraft. They produced them pretty fast. They used to take them from the factory, and the fields round about, they'd put one, perhaps one place, and another in another place. They wouldn't put them all together, because if there was raids, they would all have been bombed. They also placed decoy lights on the hills above Ben's home, to divert German bombers looking for the factory. They were bombing the mountains over here, which was a light for months and months on end, and they thought they'd got the factory, but they hadn't. The fabric is bonded to the metal frame by about 8,000 tiny bolts, and stitches tidy up the edges. Eight stitches to the inch, and that's a whole lot of sewing you're looking at. You had to be careful when you were sewing that the stitches didn't alter the tension. Eight stitches to the inch. And on one occasion, I slipped up and my stitches had gone bigger and the examiner wouldn't pass it. If the wind should get through that, well, it could start to tear, so that was no good. They had to be perfect. So what happened? I had to have it all back and unpick it. I'll never forget that. <laughs> it took such a long while. About 6,000 people were working on the Broughton production line, half of them women. 
immediate bush over the main assembly was a woman, and was little. What was she like? Rather large, and there's a little pub just outside the factory where we used to go for a drink, and she used to sit there and drink pints. I never saw her in a skirt, she'd always got trousers on. And, um, but she was very fair. I was given a young girl to train to do my job, and I had her for a month, and it was like knocking sense into a wooden door. There was nothing there, and she was holding me back. So I complained to the foreman, and um, he said, well, I've got to put up with it. And so I went to Miss Littler, and uh, I won't tell you what she said, because she wasn't very <laughs> fussy about what language she used. Well, give me the blanks, then. <laughs> Get rid of this so-and-so girl, she's holding this one back. We can't have things like that, not, not these days. Because there was a war to win. There was a war to win. Back at the fuselage, out of the tail, Vera Butler and her sister Joan worked together all the time. Vera was a lady's companion before she started building bombers two years ago. And here is the process of weatherproofing and strengthening the fabric. They used to go over it with this red dope. I think there's about seven coats of dope and uh, camouflage went on the top. And when it was finished, it, it was like a drum, just strong enough to take the wind or whatever when it was flying, like, you know. There was girls sewing and there was men there spraying them with dope. What did it smell like? Well, to me, pear drops or nail varnish. If you do smell nail varnish, you know, it takes you back. For Hilda Dodd and the rest, there were often long walks home at the end of a 12-hour shift, in the dark, and sometimes during an air raid. I was with my dad in the street. This very bright orange light came slowly down, and the policeman across the road shouted, Frank, get down on the floor. And my dad said, come on. I said, I can't, I've got a new dress on, my mother will go mad. Get down. And he lay on the top of me and this light kept coming. And then all of a sudden, there was a terrific explosion. And all as you could hear was glass tinkling everywhere. And I can see one dear soul now. She had a corset tucked under her arm, covered in soot, and they were crying, you know, they were frightened. And we were, come on in, come on in, and herding them all in the air raid shelter. It was a dreadful night. This is Phyllis Evans, who was in service as a maid before the war. She's one of them fitting the fabric covering over the framework. What did you feel about Germans at that time? Ooh, well, you wanted to beat them, didn't you? Well, I did. I used to, oh, I used to, my dad used to go mad. I used to listen to Lord Haw Haw. And he used to frighten me to death. The Royal Air Force is too weak. The Royal Navy is too weak. And as yet, the common sense of the British people is too weak to perceive the catastrophic nature of the plight into which they have allowed Churchill to lead them. I used to think, oh, I wish I could get hold of him. What I'd do to him, you know. Germany calling, Germany calling. He was very sarky with it, you know. And he used to think, how does he get to know all this? And my dad used to say, if you don't stop listening to that man, and he'd take the little wireless, and he used to switch it off, wasting good battery. <laughs> um, happier thoughts, what did you like on the radio? Oh, I used to love Arthur Askey. Anything with a laugh. I used to enjoy workers' playtime. That came on every day. It was bright. And it was dance music. And then one night I was lucky to see Tommy Handley in it, Mark. It's that man again, listening to him on the wireless. I used to love it. All right, any more for off shot? Back shot? Fulton. Fulton, Fulton, and Farnham. Now, now, come, come, don't dilly daddy. No time for letting off steam. <laughs> To entertain the production line and to improve morale, the BBC broadcast lively dance tunes every day. They called it, appropriately, Music While You Work. What was your favourite music at that time? I like Ivan Novello and those sort of things. And we had a show 
occasionally in the canteen at lunchtime. Different artists used to come along and quite a lot of the people in the factory did singing or dancing or whatever at these little shows at lunchtime. Did you? No. I'm too shy. It's a habit in this factory to rather brazenly autograph one's work. So we know that Blondie has had something to do with this bomber. How they ever flew, I'll never know, because they were only aluminium and linen. He stepped off the, off the catwalk up the middle of the plane, he foot went straight through. <laughs> I never knew how they got off the ground. Dear me. A tiny brunette, Eva Powell, who runs a crane away up there under the roof girders, brings an engine the length of the shop and gently lowers it to what they call the power egg or nacelle. It looks like an egg at that. Norman Martin over there was once third officer on the pleasure liner Rawl Pindy before she was converted to a merchant cruiser. Norman has been working on this type of aero engine for quite a time and thinks it's the finest in the world. Norman Martin died in 1975. His son Richard had no idea that his father had worked on this record-breaking Wellington LN514. I remember him telling me that the roof cranes in the factory were all driven by women, which was quite unusual for that time, but I suppose that was born out of necessity. I remember him telling me that he had a Ford 8, and driving there in the blackout, one night he crashed into a cow. Well, the cow was all right, but it didn't do the Ford 8 any good. Did he get to work? Well, one assumes so. so he was British, <laughs> so yes, he got to work. Did he talk to you about the record attempt? Uh, to be honest, no. But I did find a newspaper cutting he'd kept about it, albeit very tatty, but it is the newspaper cutting about that attempt. I'm surprised he'd never talked about it, but then I suppose during the war, he didn't talk about it. What was security like? It was pretty strict. Even when we got our wages, the home guards used to stand there with their rifles while you got paid your money. Sometimes workers had to be escorted onto the airfield to the aircraft to correct last-minute faults. They used to take us out with an Alsatian dog, you know. The special police, we call them the Gestapo. And we used to do our jobs and then they used to just escort us back because they're all so secret, don't they? The time has come to bring the component parts together. This means that the various departments are delivering their finished sections to the main assembly. And here they come. Now we'll see it take shape as a bomber. The fuselage is trundled down the factory at 6.15 in the evening, nine hours and 15 minutes after the start. The cranes come lumbering overhead with the power eggs, which are gently and firmly lowered into place and connected up. Next, the tail surfaces. The elevators and tail fin, like a big black sky knife, are lowered and connected. Each part is installed by a swiftly moving expert team. We had people bust from Liverpool from Wallington, from Wrexham, and uh, as far as you can say, and you were doing some things to throw the bombs back at them, what they've been throwing at you. So there was that comradeship there. Were there occasions when people simply didn't turn up for work? Yes, there was a government department within the factory, and you had to fill an excuse for me and say what it was. But if people persistently were absent? The Minister of Aircraft could uh, find them. Find them? Yeah, prosecute them. Some workers in some factories were very brave and very hard-working, but quite a lot weren't. And it's an absolutely amazing number of strikes. It was a hangover from the 1930s to 1920s. Industrial relations in Britain had been disastrous. Management had been pretty poor too. And a lot of workers who had suffered through the Depression, when the war came and their services were desperately needed, they couldn't see why the fact we were fighting a war should stop them from using their opportunity to get higher wages to impose their demand. And Churchill was absolutely appalled by a lot of what went on in the factory. Newspaper tycoon Lord Beaverbrook, as Britain's Minister of Aircraft Production, warned Prime Minister Winston Churchill in the winter of 1940, as these war cabinet papers reveal, that the cumulative effect of enemy bombing is making itself felt on our production lines they were becoming very thin. I remember Lord Beaver just walked around the factory and out. Usual thing, wasn't it? And Churchill was on the phone to the factory all the while. Beaverbrook also warned about absenteeism, 
the length of time production line workers spent in air raid shelters, and the morale of the workforce. We had some people who were directed down from Scotland under the Labour Act at the time. One or two didn't like it. I don't know how they got on, but they weren't there for long. They were shifted out. Everything was done to keep the men and women at work on the production line. To uh, help you stay in the factory. We had our own dentist there. We had our, even had our own barber there. So you could never get a pass out to go and have a haircut. We had a good surgery, the doctor. And that was to keep you on the production keep, line? To keep you on the production line. This is the bomb beam, like a compact miniature bridge. Look at the speed with which they set the bulletproof petrol tanks into the main plane. They had these special tanks that used to go in. They were bulletproof, self-sealing, actually. When this is done, the overhead crane picks up the wings and sweeps them into position where skillful hands guide them into place. Now the bomber is complete with its 80-foot wingspan. It won't be long now before this bomber is loaded with an outward-bound cargo for Germany at the rate they're going. Tiny Cooling flew 67 missions in Bomber Command, most of them on Wellingtons. In the air, that was where it belonged and where you belonged in it. And between you, you reveled in it. He flew a Wellington over Dunkirk to protect the retreating British troops in 1940. I remember peering down and looking at the battleground underneath. You make damn sure to keep well clear of anywhere where our own troops were. He flew his Wellington over the occupied Channel ports as the Germans then prepared to invade Britain. They were basically river ports, assembly places like Rotterdam where the barges would assemble. And really what you were looking down at was an expanse of water in the quasi-moonlight. And if there was any movement, you went for that. It is 11 hours and 23 minutes since the record-breaking attempt began. The night workers arrive along with the port air screw. At the same time, another crew is fitting the starboard propeller. The workers are beginning to make bets. For after all, there are still 17 hours and 20 minutes to go in that 30-hour mark they've set themselves. Eileen Lindfield worked the night shift. She had unofficial uses for any discarded felt left over from the fuselage covering. The Irish linen they covered the planes with, if they didn't reach from one end of the plane to the other, they just threw it down on the floor, you know. And it was very sought after for curtains and everything. You used to make slippers out of it. I mean, nobody could buy anything. It was all on coupons. And slippers were a luxury. But, you know, when people say they're hard up now and go without, they don't know what the meaning of the word is. The hardships people went through in the war. There was no water bottles, there was no cameras. Everything was on coupons. It doesn't matter how much money you had, you couldn't buy anything because it was all for the war, you know. Ivy Bennett caught my eye. I noticed her because she was wearing a very sheer pink chiffon blouse. I remarked on it, but Ivy grinned and said she'd come away from a party in a hurry so that she could get on this night shift and help to make this record-breaking bomber. Do you remember going to dances and that sort of thing? Yeah, we did in the war, yes. If the men were on leave and all that, they were all in their uniform. Were there any liaisons that the husbands might have frowned upon? Well, I suppose so, but I don't think I got into, into any mischief. We didn't have a lot of time, really. We had um, the Miners Welfare Institute in Fly. We had dances at the weekends, but I couldn't misbehave because my mother was always in the kitchen making tea. She was always there and I had to come home with her, so I couldn't misbehave if I wanted to. <laughs> I'm sure you didn't want to. No, I didn't. No, I didn't. No, he was a good girl. The rear turret arrives on a portable crane. Robert Davis skillfully guides it into place. There was no idleness. You got on with your jobs. Even lavatory breaks were strictly rationed. There was a lady in charge and you were allowed six minutes. And if you were longer than that, she'd come and bang on the door. Come on, your time's up. One time, I wanted to go to a dance, which was not very often, and you didn't get your hair set or anything then. So I thought, what can I do? So I took a comb and a little mirror in my overall pocket, and I flushed the toilet twice to make sure the water was clean, and I dipped my comb in and I was setting my hair. 
So I had to pretend, you know, I'd been to the toilet, but I hadn't. Did she bang on the door? Oh, yes. Come on, your time's up. Out you come. <laughs> but she didn't know what I'd been doing. She hadn't tweaked. Before our unbelieving eyes, the bomber really looks like an aircraft. Ernest Tootle, who used to be a coach painter, applies the RAF rondel on the fuselage and wing. I don't know where he gets that steady hand at three in the morning, or you'll notice that he does it freehand. Ernest Tootle worked on Wellingtons throughout the war. He nearly lost his life in one of them, as his son Peter remembers. He'd been working inside the bomb hatch. The bomb hatch was, was closed up and he was working inside it. And this particular plane was off down the runway with him in the bomb hatch. Went for a few circles around the aerodrome in the bomb hatch. <laughs> Did he tell you what he said? Well, I couldn't remember the exact words, but um, there were a lot of stars and asterisks involved. I don't know whether he thought he was going to die, but he was quite explicit with some of the things that he said. Ernest's grandson, James, now works in the same hangar in which his grandfather built Wellingtons all those years ago. James helps to build the wings of the giant high-tech Airbus. I'm a manufacturing shop support engineer. It's just providing support to the operators manufacturing the wings. If they've got any problems, they come and see us about any issues that they might have. If they've drilled holes in wrong positions, oversized holes. When you're on your placements around the factory, you get to see the billet of aluminium that the wing starts from, from start to end. It's quite strange at Broughton because you've just seen a wing, you don't see the complete aircraft. But it'd be nice to see something from start to finish. The Broughton factory is the British partner in the long-established European Airbus project. It also involves factories in Spain and Germany and France. Once the wings are built here at Broughton, they're transported by air and road to be assembled into the complete aircraft at Toulouse in France. Does it ever cross your mind that your grandfather used to build Wellington bombers in this place? It was funny because um, a few weeks back um, it was mentioned about the 24-hour bomber that was made. But you can imagine now how different the factory is compared to what it was then. At half past ten at night, the landing wheels are installed. Wheels four and a half feet high that weigh 300 pounds. Meanwhile, further inspections are taking place and checked off on the progress charts as each detail is okay. Wilf Williams was 16 when he first enrolled at the Broughton factory. That weekend, he'd worked all day Saturday on Wellington N514. I came on the second, on the second stage after the fabric had, had uh, been put over the uh, fuselage. I went home at three o'clock in the after, Saturday afternoon. On the Sunday morning, I was pretty surprised to find it had left the production line and gone into the running shed. As the clock at the end of the assembly line points to 20 minutes past three, a tractor tows the bomber to the running shed. This is a huge area at the end of the production line where final inspections and the first engine tests are made. Curiously, in an affair that mainly concerned Britain's fighter command, the Wellington heavy bomber unintentionally was to play a vital role in the Battle of Britain. In the summer of 1940, when Britain and the Commonwealth stood alone and at bay against the apparently irresistible might of Nazi Germany, the Luftwaffe were weakening the RAF's fighter command by bombing its airfields and radar stations and sometimes catching the fighters as they climbed to meet them. The Luftwaffe brought a fighter command in the southeast of England very, very close to the edge of defeat by its attacks on airfields and radar stations. By Late August, things were very, very serious indeed. Then, by accident, some German bombs fell on the outskirts of London. And Churchill was furious, and Churchill insisted that the RAF must retaliate against Berlin. And on 1924, 25th August, the Wellingtons and some Hamlins and Whitleys set out for Berlin. Very few of them dropped bombs, even anywhere near anything that mattered. But they enraged Hitler. And Hitler from that moment insisted that the Luftwaffe shift its aiming point to major British cities and it was one of the turning points of the Battle of Britain. London suffered terribly 
The cost to Londoners was enormous, but London could take it. Churchill described it as like a great enormous wounded animal, that it could go on receiving punishment. Whereas if the Luftwaffe had gone on attacking fighter commands, airfields and radar stations strategically, this would have been far, far more serious. So that RAF raid against Berlin and others that followed did have a significant effect on the Battle of Britain. It is 18 hours and 20 minutes since work began on Wellington LN 514. There's a feeling of high expectancy in the air, for there in front of us is what we think is the fastest job of bomber construction in the world. Now, will it run? There are only two complete Wellington bombers in existence today. This one, at the Aeronautical Museum at Brooklands, was rescued from Loch Ness, where she'd crash-landed on December 31st, 1940. She ditched so gently that the crew were able to walk out onto the wings, into their rescue dinghies, and onto the Scottish shore. This aircraft was one of Bomber Command's main strike force of Wellington's in the early years of the war. Bomber Command continued to hit at Berlin and other cities. There was a wonderful moment later in the year when the Germans were trying to convince the Russian Foreign Minister, Molotov, that the British were beaten, that it was all over. And in the middle of a dinner at the Russian Embassy, um, suddenly the air raid siren goes in the middle of Berlin and they all have to go down to the cellar. And Molotov enraged the Germans by saying to them, if the British are really beaten, then why do we have this air raid alarm and who is dropping these bombs? And it was probably a Wellington that did it. Like seagulls following a liner, the workers tag after it to continue their jobs. From Ivy Bennett in her ship on blouse to George Williams, who is almost blind, every one of these British men and women has given of his best. Have you any idea, Hilda, how many Wellingtons you actually worked on? Crikey, no. You were doing miles and miles of machine work, so... You just took each day as it came. You just knew it was going towards making a bomber. Because it did make you think, you know, when you're doing them. We used to wonder what happened to the bombers. Were they lucky or not? Tiny Cooling piloted a Wellington bomber into action 67 times. My policy was when I came up to the target to have a good look around and see what was going on and see what's the artist's place and go and find one that was the quietest. And if it was hot at 10,000 feet, I'd drop down to 8,000 or something like that. And I used that throughout the war. If you were briefed for a particularly hot place, you had this trepidation, a sort of, well, I suppose you might say a windy feeling in the pit of the stomach as uh, much like when you were a schoolboy and you were waiting to go to see the dentist. But as soon as you got in the aeroplane, it was gone. Do you think that applied to everybody? I've no idea. Well, it's not a thing one talked about. You never discussed fear? No. Did others show fear? Not show it, no. Nobody ever showed it. Then, at precisely 15 minutes past six on this Sunday morning, Exactly 21 hours and 15 minutes from the start of construction, the bomber is a complete fighting unit and sees the light of the first dawn of its lifetime. Air crew called the Wellington the Wimpy because there was a legendary cartoon character of that period called Jay Wellington Wimpy. And the Wimpy was a ton of terrific affection. They loved this aeroplane. They thought it was simply marvelous. So like a gallery at a sporting event, the workers stand and watch. Then comes the big moment. The engineer climbs into the cabin, and the engines are started up for the first time. Well, I can't think of any occasion when the aircraft let me down. There might have been one or two occasions when one got into trouble through one's own fault. But believe you me, you just sort of let the aircraft take over and it would pull you out. Tiny Cooling flew his 67 missions in Wellington's, more than two complete tours of duty, between 1939 and 1945, in Europe, Italy and the Middle East. In that time, more than 10,000 members of Bomber Command were killed in action. Didn't stop to think about that. Why not? 
because it wouldn't happen to you. It might happen to the next chap on the next table, but it wouldn't happen to you. We all know that time is racing, but still a generator and an air screw need some last minute adjustments and there's a final bit of stitching to do. This holds us up almost two hours. It was one of the toughest and most dangerous jobs of the war. To complete a tour of operations, you had to do 30 trips. And for a lot of the war, Bomber Command was losing about one in 20. That meant you had a better chance of dying than you did of surviving your 30 trips. Everything has received its final test and OK, and the bomber is ready for the takeoff. It's full daylight and 10 minutes to 9 in the morning. 10 minutes short of an exact 24-hour day that the finished bomber is rolled out onto the tarmac adjoining the factory. The record is going to be really shattered and no mistake. In a way, of course, in a Wellington bomber, each member of the crew fought a slightly different war, didn't they? Did, they? Yeah. Because if you think of the rear gunner, he's miles away oh, from Oh, yes, yes. You gave him a shout once in a while to say, Hi, Tex, you're still awake? The wireless operator is wrapped up in wires and earphones and God knows what, and never says anything to anybody. The navigator's sort of in and out all over the, every few minutes with a little chitty saying, change course to this or ETA there and that sort of business. And Bill, my bomb aimer, was the man who stood beside me in the well whilst I flew and who, if I got stiff or needed to pee or something like that, I'd say to Bill, take over for five minutes, would you? And I'd get out of the seat and he'd climb in and he'd fly it for a while. And there was this total reliance one upon the other that you never even questioned their ability to do what you asked them or whether they would give you to the utmost, if required. Is that a definition of love? In a sense, yes. In the Shakespearean sense, yes. I never ceased to be deeply moved by what those very young men did and the letters they left behind them. In the last year of the war, Tiny Cooling wrote a poem. This muster of names, this directory of faithless, formless beings, suffocates the mind. Is it solely a tabulation as on pages of Smith's in volume S to Z, or a company of friends awaiting recognition amidst the legion of strangers? In the quest, shadows emerge, forgotten faces relive brief moments of shared experience and call upon yet others to be identified. Now what became of him and him? And their names too are carved in the roster. I dare not look for my own, it should be there. Our flight commander Hinks, quiet Ronnie Frost, he joined with me. Young Naylor lost in the North Sea. Was he 20 when he came into my room and cried like a child the night Bob Hewitt died, leaving a pregnant wife? Three weeks later, I helped to clear his room and found his Bible by his bed. Naylor was a young navigator, and I remember lying in bed one morning, I think we'd just come back from a place like Cologne or something, and there was a tap on the door and young Naylor walked in and stood at the foot of my bed. He just fell to his knees, buried his face in the blankets of my bed and cried. And I said, what's up? He said, Bob Hewitt's missing. Everybody liked young Naylor, but nobody took the blindest bit of notice of him because he didn't look as if he'd been out of his pram for more than a few days. Was there anything you could say to comfort him? No, 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 not really. It was just the luck of the game. It required a very special kind of courage to fly the Bomber Command. In the most literal sense, they died with their shoes clean because um, they had a very cosy, comfortable, cosseted life at their bases in England, that they were nicely fed and they had bacon and eggs before they took off, and some of them were able to live in quarters with their wives. And then they would, every night, 
get in these planes and fly out from these calm, still Norfolk and Lincolnshire fields into the darkness over Germany, into the whitest heat of war. These brightly coloured lights went shooting past and there seemed to be lots of them straight ahead and as we go up to them they seemed to part to let us through. And then all of a sudden there was a thwack. Black guns, night fighters and searchlights. They were seeing their mates being shot down every night. And I remember calling out to Dougie, we've been hit and he said where and I told him and he said keep an eye on it. And they would go through this fantastically intense and terrifying experience for six, eight hours. A few minutes later, he said, anything to see? And I said, no, it's dead quiet. And he said, all right, fine, we'll be home in an hour. Wait until we get down and we'll have a look. And then they would come back, this calm, quiet, Lincolnshire or Norfolk airfield. And I could smell petrol. And it was dripping from the cell ceiling tank on the starboard side. And Dougie saying to me, Oh, we're back in time before the bars close. Come on, I'll buy you a beer to mark your first trip. And they'd go to the mess, they'd have the baked and eggs, and then two nights later they'd be asked to do the same thing again. But usually with two or three less of the crews than had gone out the previous night. Here comes the test pilot, Gerald Winnie, a really amazed man. He was planning to fly the bomber this afternoon. But so fast has this aircraft been completed that they got him out of bed to put the bomber through its paces. I was told that they'd gone to fetch the pilot, because obviously he didn't expect it to so quick. And I think his words were, I hope to God they haven't missed anything. Everything went like clockwork. I was really overwhelmed, but I was fascinated as well to think that you could start a plane and then it could go down the line and actually fly. We all went out onto the tarmac to watch the takeoff. Everybody was pleased that they'd done it. I mean, there were no parties that I can remember or anything like that. Like The old factory saw a takeoff. They were all outside to watch it. That must have been quite a moment. Oh, it was really. Here it comes, and the bomber is airborne. The record? Yes, they broke it, those workers. What was that moment when it took off? Oh, great, he got a good round of applause and shouted. He did a few circuits and bumps. So we were very pleased with that. Job well done. Airbus marked this unique occasion with an official photograph. So on the count of three, ladies and gentlemen, let's go for it. One, two, three. Everybody wave. Now, is the hard one. Wave and smile. OK, <laughs> wave and smile. Let's go for it. Wave and smile. For these people, this was simply a 24-hour snapshot of their lives during World War II. But the war was to last six years. Their men came home eventually. And for the women who had built Wellington LN514, life changed yet again. And did you continue to work at Broughton? No. I had the sack. <laughs> I was made redundant. A few weeks later, they turned over to prefabricated houses. The girls that were single, they were kept on, but I was married and I had to finish. How did you feel about that? A bit annoyed, actually. I signed on the door and I had dole for three weeks, and that's the only thing I've ever had off the government. And because I wouldn't go to Bolton to work in a cotton factory, they stopped me dole. So what did you do? They have done my army allowance until Harry came home. What was that day like when he did come home from the war? There was no telephones in those days. I was outside the local church watching a wedding. And my mother was there, and she went home for something, and she said, I think you better get, go home. Addie's at home waiting for you. And I got a little cottage ready for when he came home. The people he worked for before the war, they got a little estate, and there was two little cottages on it, and I had one, and it was furnished ready by he came home. My dad came home Christmas morning, 
Did either of them ever talk about what they did in the war? No. Did it affect Harry? Never the same again. Hilda Dodd's Percy came home in 1944. Oh, well, I was over the moon. I couldn't believe it, you know, it was wonderful. It's a very funny feeling after three and a half years, and then I thought, I wonder if he's gone off me. <laughs> I don't he still likes me. <laughs> he hadn't altered much to me. He had fair hair, but he was fairer. And he was, you know, a well-built lad. And he came in, and he was hungry, and he cooked himself egg and bacon. And of course, when he, his mum got up, oh, she said, I see you've had some breakfast. He'd only eaten the whole rations for the week. <laughs> he didn't know. Throughout the war, Percy carried with him this photograph of Hilda. He brought it back with him at the end of the war? Yes, I have the photograph. And when he, he showed it me, and I said, oh, it's coloured, because I sent it just ordinary. He said, yes, don't ever lose this. He said, I treasure this. I said, why? And he said, well, one of my mates had his hands blown off. Mm. He held a brush in his mouth and tinted it up. I was very upset about it at the time, but I've never parted with it. It doesn't seem to lose any of its colour. Eileen Lindfield found it hard to adjust to the reappearance in her life of her husband, Stan. We were so independent and the women did a man's job and they behaved like men and... And I think it took us a little while to sort of get going. I'm glad I experienced the war, but I wouldn't like to think it happening again. Nobody wins a war, so better without. Over a single weekend, from first bolt to last, these workers built this Wellington bomber in 10 minutes less than 24 hours. They smashed the existing world record by a whole day. Wellington LN 514 took off 24 hours and 48 minutes into the workers' weekend. Tiny Cooling flew his Wellington into action over Germany and France, Belgium and Egypt, Sicily and Italy, 67 times. It was always nice when the word came up from under your feet saying, Bomb's gone! And the navigator would be up almost before the words were out of Bill Holmes' mouth and saying, course to steer. And you'd set it on the compass and you'd weave your way home. And you'd see the flare pass flickering ahead and you'd come in on the final approach and that lovely softness as you closed your engines down on finals and felt for the ground. And the good old wimpy just let you down like a babe on a cushion. And that was another one over. In all, during World War II, British factories turned out 11,461 Wellington bombers. Stay with us here on BBC Four, a dramatic time in the life of Otis Redding next as we look back to his 1967 tour of Britain, Soul Ambassador, in just a moment. <laughs> 